And I will now turn it over to Dr. Jack Rhodes for his virtual lecture on Dr. Holmes and, or <laughs> Sherlock Holmes and the Spider Woman. All right, that's fine. Okay, well, small audience, but here we go. So thanks for attending this afternoon. And our, our series, a long running series of First Thursday films at the Wapaka Library. Of course, the sad fact of the business is that right now these have to be virtual. And what I'm doing here is an introduction to the Spider Woman, also known as Sherlock Holmes and the Spider Woman. There are many copies of this library, uh, many library copies here in Wapaka and elsewhere. And you can get that on DVD or the whole movie is available on YouTube. I'm gonna to talk to you for about 15 minutes. Last time we met in person for one of our movies was way back in March of 2020 when the pandemic was approaching and that movie, if you're curious, was The Apartment with Jack Lemmon and Shirley MacLaine. We hope to return to regular programming in person at the library as soon as possible. Meanwhile, I wanna thank Laura and I wanna thank uh, Joni both for their assistance in preparing this. And let's talk about Sherlock Holmes and the Spider Woman. This uh, movie was released in 1944 during wartime by Universal International. So whenever you had a villain like the Spider Woman, you always sort of suspected in the background, there might be some difficult connection with the Nazis or somebody that's not explicit in the movie, but it certainly is implied she's very villainous. Depending on when you start the counting, this was either the seventh or the fifth movie in the Sherlock Holmes series, released first by 20th Century Fox and then by Universal. The history of that is pretty interesting. By a triumph of casting in 1939, 20th Century Fox uh, cast Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and N Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. They were a big hit. The Hound of the Baskervilles was a major success in 1939 and spawned a sequel called The Adventures of Sir Sherlock Holmes in 1940, again starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. But as the war went on, 20th Century Fox had other things to do and they did not continue the series beyond the second one. Universal International bought the series from them and the rights and went forward with 12 short movies between 60 and 70 minutes long. Ours today is 62 minutes long. And the idea of these movies was to cash in on the Sherlock Holmes idea. And for the first three or four, they explicitly talked about Sherlock Holmes fighting the evil powers of Nazis. They didn't quite say Nazi Germany, but uh, sometimes they did. And you'll see a reference to this at the very end of the movie when the movie concludes in a uh, carnival with um, likenesses of Mussolini, Tojo, and Hitler. So then Universal made 12 of these movies and the Spider Woman is the fifth of those. They all had the same director, almost all 11 of them, Roy William Neal. And since he's not very well known to people, I thought I might take a moment and just say a word or two about him. He's born in 1886, and by the tender age of very little, 1912, he's already a war correspondent in China. In 1916, he made his way to Hollywood and started, uh, began directing silent films. He was always known to quote one critic as a competent, budget-minded, above average, B-movie director. He never rose above the B-movies like the Sherlock Holmes series, but he did them well. So as I say, between 43 and 46, he directed 11 of the 12 Sherlock Holmes movies. I think it's important to remember in the age of <clears throat> television, streaming, and social media in which we live, that the movies used to have a very central place in American life, and for that matter, British and around the world. The quantity of series films in the 30s and 40s was amazing. It is as if it is, there was no TV, there was radio, but it is as if you, without those, you still had people wanting to go to the same entertainment. They wanted to fall in love with their characters. And so they wanted to have uh, a relationship with those characters. And they were e eager to build that up into a series, even as we later watch television series. So some of these series might be worth mentioning. There are series, if they continued to feature the same actors, if they were made by the same studio, and I'll just run through a number of them. They were made in eight days. They came out very quickly. They are all about an hour long, often went on double bills. And so we have all kinds of people out there. Certainly we have the comedies, like Blondie comedies. We have uh, the Westerns, Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, Hopalong Cassidy. 
Maisie, Ma and Pa Kettle for the comedies, Tarzan, Jungle Jim, uh, Bomba the Jungle Boy, all for jungle adventures, you know, with a lot of potted plants sitting around on a Hollywood lot. And they weren't really in Africa any more than the audience was, but they made believe and, and fooled us. And perhaps of these, the most prolific was the detective mystery series. Just to name a few of the detectives who were on the screen in the 30s and 40s, maybe they'll ring a bell. Boston Blackie, Charlie Chan, The Crime Doctor, Ellery Queen, The Falcon, Mr. Moto, Mr. Wong, Philo Vance, The Saint, Dick Tracy, Michael Shane, Sherlock Holmes, and The Thin Man. And our focus today, of course, is on Sherlock Holmes. So the audience going to this, these movies would know about the central character. They would often know about a recurring villain like Professor Moriarty, who was played by one or two different people during the Sherlock Holmes series. They would even know some of the minor foils that appeared all the time. Mary Gordon as Mrs. Hudson, the housekeeper at 221B Baker Street. They would know Inspector Lestrade, played by Dennis Hoey, and they would know certainly that Lestrade was never going to solve the case without the assistance of Holmes and Watson. And they would pretty much expect a specific outcome. That expectation would be that Sherlock Holmes would meet a difficult adversary, but eventually carry the day. And the better the villain, then the more exciting the picture. One of the most memorable of all his adversaries is the Spider Woman. Let's fall back first, though, and talk just a little bit about Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote the books and made all this possible. Doyle was born in Edinburgh in 1859 and went to school at the University of Edinburgh, became a medical student. He was under the influence of Dr. Joseph Bell, who was at that time head of one of the departments and had much to do with what our author learned about poisons and methods of death and how the body worked and so forth. So in 1887, he comes out with a study in Scarlet, a Sherlock Holmes novel, and in 1892, with a book of stories, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. By 1902, The Hound of the Baskervilles appears. He was not only a writer of mysteries and a doctor, but he was also very interested in the occult, and that shows up in many of his movies, particularly The Hound of the Baskervilles. Everything is done at night, it's at fog, uh, London fog, you know, it's all very, very much typical. The scene is set for us, we know what the scene is going to be. But he also wrote The Lost World, uh, published in 1912, made into a 1925 silent movie, and remade in 1960 with uh, Michael Rennie and Pat Boone as um, people <laughs> trying to follow through this about The Lost World. So now, interest in spiritualism, we've mentioned A Scandal in Bohemia, his last story for Sherlock Holmes, His Last Bow, appeared in 1917. And we should talk then a little bit about the Spider Woman herself and the movie. Leonard Maltin says that Sherlock Holmes and the Spider Woman is, quote, rip-roaring series entry, thrills to spare, one of the best in the Sherlock Holmes series. Of course, for the villain to be memorable, as Maltin also notes, that villain has to have menace, has to have a certain degree of creepiness, and also have charm and be classy. And underneath the veneer of that charm and classiness, can be a lot of darkness and villainy. And to personify that, they turn to Gail Sondergaard to play the role of the Spider Woman. I'm gonna spend a little extra time on Gail Sondergaard because I don't think people probably know very much about her today. Though she has the distinction of being the winner of the first Best Supporting Actress Award uh, for the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. She won the first Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. Before 1936, the Academy had only Best Actor, Best Actress. But then they started adding various categories, including Best Supporting Actor and Actress. And in 36, Walter Brennan won the first Best Actor Award for the movie Come and Get It, with Wisconsin setting and written by Appleton's own Edna Ferber. Well, we're talking here not about Brennan, though, but about Gail Sondergaard. And Gail won the first Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress for a movie named Anthony Adverse, which is based on a hugely popular novel about that thick and also starring Frederick March as Anthony Adverse and a great many major stars. But this was her first movie and she won the Oscar right away. Later, she was the menacing housekeeper in The Cat and the Canary with Bob Hope. 
And then she was the menacing Eurasian lady who was the nemesis for Betty Davis in the letter. She appeared in The Black Cat also with Basil Rathbone, Sherlock Holmes and the Spider Woman. And because that was successful, Universal made a rather bad B picture with her, Spider Woman Strikes Back. You can imagine it even from the title. And then in 1946 came Anna and the King of Siam in which she played Madame Chang and got another Oscar nomination. All of this, all of this together from a lady born in Minnesota, Litchfield, Minnesota, I believe, educated at the University of Minnesota. She then went on to television work. And I always, I wanna mention something contemporary that she did. Gail Sondergaard was the woman, the uh, woman Shawan, the native woman, the major woman character in Return of a Man Called Horse with Richard Harris. You might remember they had done A Man Called Horse with Judith Anderson, and then The Return of a Man Called Horse with Richard Harris starred uh, our topic for today, Gail Sondergaard. There are some interesting almosts in her career, and Judith Anderson is part of that story. Her career would have been very different, perhaps, if Gail had been cast for either one or both of these roles. But as it was, she was second best. Uh, it turned out that in Rebecca, directed by Alfred Hitchcock, she was strongly considered for the role of Mrs. Danvers, who is the creepy housekeeper who plays an important role in the movie, but the role went to Judith Anderson after all. That was in 1940. The year before, perhaps of even more interest, she was strongly considered, tested for the role of the Wicked Witch in Wizard of Oz. Yes, the Wizard of Oz. It was Margaret Hamilton, as we all know, who got to say those lines like, I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. But it was Gail Sondergaard who almost got to say those lines. There is a book on the 75th anniversary of The Wizard of Oz, which came out just a few years ago, which shows Gail Sondergaard in costume as the Wicked Witch of the West. They have three or four shots of her. She didn't get the role because ultimately it was decided she was too pretty, too beautiful. Sinister, but not ugly enough. And Margaret Hamilton said during an interview late in her life, she was lucky that she was homely enough that she could play the Wicked Witch of the West and not Gail Sondergaard. So I don't need to say too much more about her other than to say there is a Milwaukee connection. One of her first stage jobs was with the John Kellard Shakespeare Company, which I don't know much about, and she was playing in The Merchant of Venice. She also did theater in Minneapolis and Chicago, and particularly with the Theater Guild in 1928, the understudy and the strange interlude, this is the irony of being in dramatics. The understudy to Judith Anderson, for whom she later lost the role in Rebecca, and there you go. It's just all kind of generally incestuous, these Hollywood factoids when you get to them. I do think though that a very, very good point was made by a critic called Eric Nissen, who talking about Gail Sondergaard said, when she found her signature look, she just stuck to it. She was also reputed to be the animators, what you call vision, I guess would be the best word. Uh, they didn't use her to paint her, but they did use her as the inspiration. That's what I want for the Wicked Queen and Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So in a sense, she almost got the part of Snow White's evil stepmother too. Oh, well, along it goes. Uh, I guess it's uh, okay to say that toward the end, she was one of the Hollywood 10, or her husband was, and during the time of the House on american Activities Committee, and that may be one reason why we don't remember her much, her career was sort of chopped off for seven, eight years before she went on to television work in the best of everything and many other series and cameo appearances. As I said, she had appeared with Basil Rathbone before in The Black Cat, but this time she was to be the villain. Well, Basil Rathbone, we can't have a Sherlock Holmes movie without talking about the definitive Basil Rathbone, the Sherlock Holmes. No matter how many have come and gone, and they've been very good, Jeremy Brett, many, many others. It's still Sherlock Holmes, Basil Rathbone. We tend to come back to in classic movies when we start talking about the major detective of the day. Rathbone has a connection also, by the way, because his student was affiliated with Lawrence University. All right, his, his son, I meant to say, was a student at Lawrence University. So, born 1892, dies in 1967. Rathbone is born in Johannesburg to British parents, British citizens. 
makes his stage debut in 1911, and he plays a lot of Shakespeare. The coming of sound brought out a great, great piece of luck, you might say, for Basil Rathbone because his distinctive voice and manner were discovered for the movies. You know, he has that distinctive voice. Anytime you hear him, even if this movie is on and you're in the other room, you can tell when Basil Rathbone is speaking, that voice is very distinctive. And so Hollywood began to use him in a number of movies when they needed uh, an oily villain. Might remember him as Sir Guy of Gisborne and the Adventures of Robin Hood with Errol Flynn with that 10 minute long sword fight up and down the staircases of the castle. And for which I'm told Rathbun was able to do his own fencing because he knew how. Well, quite interesting guy. He got two Oscar nominations, 1936 for Romeo and Juliet, and in 1938, If I Were King, which I admit is a movie I haven't yet had an opportunity to see. Examples, though, of his mass output, in 1930 alone, he made six movies, six movies in one year. That's really working hard. He appeared in so many roles as Philo Vance in the Bishop murder case at Mr. Murdstone is in David Copperfield in A Tale of Two Cities. I've already mentioned Robin Hood, The Court Jester with Danny Kaye, The Last Hurrah, directed by John Ford, starring Spencer Tracy. And then he went into business with Roger Corman and several of those Vincent Price type horror movies in color for American International Pictures and kind of wound up his career in that category in those days. His attending physician, Nigel Bruce, Dr. Watson, born in 1895, lived a short life, died in 1953, only 58 years old. He was the real thing in many ways. He was wounded in World War I service with the British Army. He played Dr. Watson for eight years on the long-running Sherlock Holmes radio series to a number of different Sherlock Holmeses. And he made several movies, Treasure Island, The Scarlet Pimpernel, Kidnapped, Rebecca, Suspicion. Those were both for Hitchcock, those last two. Lassie Come Home as the kindly Laird opposite Elizabeth Taylor and Roddy McDowell and Edmund Gwynn. So he had a rich variety of playing English, lords, and gentlemen who were perhaps just a little not bright enough to help solve the mysteries. And it's true, as some people have complained, that in these movies made by Universal, he comes off mostly as a comic foil. Once in a great while, he will come up with a discovery in these movies. Most of the time, he's there for something like comedy relief. Well, our time won't go on much longer, so I want to give you three things to look for when you watch Sherlock Holmes and the Spider Woman. Number one, the three central performances. Holmes and Watson, as continuing characters, are able to fine tune their performance. They've done it six times before all the way from The Hound of the Baskervilles. And people, as I say, coming into the theater know what to expect of them. Gail Sondergaard is doing a one-shot. She makes no other Sherlock Holmes series movies, just this one, as Adria Spedding, also known as the Spider Woman. And she, I think, deserves a lot of credit for giving such a vivid portrayal all the way down the line to the last moment. Some of the other people we've already mentioned, like Mary Gordon as the housekeeper and uh, Dennis Hoey as Inspector Lestrade are important. And I'd like you to take a look. If you, have, if you have seen the movie, you'll know what I mean. If you're going to see the movie, you'll notice at the very end, when our villainess is apprehended, do we see her slammed in jail? No. Do we see her meet an untimely death? No. We see her walking off with Inspector Lestrade, who has captured her arm in arm, and with her little enigmatic smile, most of us that see this movie firmly believe that pretty soon she will fool Lestrade and escape from him and the Spider Woman will be on the loose again. That's how they could make the Spider Woman strikes back. So look at the performances. Number two, look at a particular scene for me, the clever scene about midway through the picture in which the Spider Woman visits Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson at 221B Baker Street and brings along a child purported to be her nephew. The child is played by the child actor Teddy Infer, I-H-N-H-U-F-F-U-H-R, excuse me, Infer, I-N-F-U-H-R. And they come to visit. There's a genuine sense of creepiness. This is a scene in which Sherlock Holmes and Watson almost get done in physically. 
by the spider woman. She's very clever, very crafty, appears to be above board as the nephew. This little kid is barefoot on Dr. Watson's lap, counting his toes. He's eating candy bars. He hops along, he catches flies, he listens to them and so forth. He's strange, but he seems perfectly reasonable. You'll have to be the judge of what she was up to with that little incident. And then the overall touch finally of mystery. So we have the central performances, that specific scene about halfway through the movie, which I think is the best directed, best written scene in the picture. And then the overall feeling of mystery, the tone of the movie, the black and white cinematography, the ambiance, the fog which is present even from the beginning as we see Holmes and Watson walking through it as part of the signature introduction of the series. All of that I think works to put it all together, put, taking the child to visit, all of that. And they put innocent things in considerable uh, different, in a considerably different light. At the end of the movie, the Sherlock Holmes and the Spider Woman concludes on the set of a carnival. And you think to yourself, well, carnivals, that's a pretty good place to do it because we know that carnivals have a history of being fun and bright, but underneath them and behind the tents often lurks something very, very dangerous. And Holmes will find that out in our movie for today. So to wrap up, thank you for attending virtually. Watch the movie and enjoy it, either via the library movies or YouTube. And our next First Thursday film is scheduled for October 7th, Thursday at 1.30 Central Time at the Wapaka Public Library. It is my fond hope that it can be in person in some way, but if not, we will try to do the best we can with a special British romance, Brief Encounter, directed by the great David Lean. In the meantime, look at the Spider Woman, enjoy, have a great time, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.